Amen. We are in Isaiah 26 tonight. It is good to be back in Isaiah. It has been, it's been some weeks. I think it's been a month, maybe more than a month that we've been away. And I'm glad that even though we're not together in person, we don't have to be away from Isaiah again tonight. If you uh, weren't with us at the top, I guess we start at the bottom of the hour now, at the beginning of the service. Between uh, a birthday party and a home group and a youth group, it just seemed prudent um, to throw a circuit breaker with the number of people just that we're aware of that either have tested positive or are waiting for tests because they know that they've been exposed to COVID. It just, it seemed wise, it seemed loving um, to throw a circuit breaker and try to protect our in-person gathering on Sunday. The question that we always ask in making decisions in life and in ministry is what would love do? What does love do here? And the loving answer to us was clear. Um, going online only tonight, online only for youth group on Friday night, and we're also going to postpone again our Sunday potluck in, in the hopes and with the intention of preserving our in-person gathering Sunday morning. Um, and I fully expect that to happen. One of the people who's been exposed to COVID is me. Um, so hopefully my test will come back negative. But if it doesn't, then that is what it is. And the Lord has a plan for that. I wasn't sure that we were going to have a worship leader tonight. And Hannah said, well, wait a minute. I can, I can jump in. I, I do that. And so God had a plan for worship tonight. And uh, he's got a plan for Sunday. We'll see together what it is but tonight we're in Isaiah 26 but because it's been a few weeks since we've been there let's take a moment to remind ourselves what's been happening in Isaiah by the way if you haven't noticed down in the comments we do have an outline for tonight's study um, those of you who have been with us through Isaiah remember that a brother in the Lord um, jumped up and said hey we're covering a lot of really deep stuff here. It would be great just to have a written outline to, to reference to, to get a head start on note taking. So I think a PDF of that is in the comments on the Facebook stream um, if, uh, if, if you want to download that and follow along. But Isaiah 13 began a section of Isaiah a section of burdens, a section of judgments. Judgments primarily against the nations, Babylon, Assyria, Philistia, Moab, Damascus, Ethiopia, Egypt, Babylon again, Arabia. And then in Isaiah 22, God turned his attention to Jerusalem. And Isaiah 22 was the, the pronouncement of judgment of woe against Jerusalem. Isaiah 23 was judgment against Tyre. But as we dug into it, we discovered Tyre was just a placeholder for the world economic system. And then chapter 24, what some call the little apocalypse of Isaiah, that culminates this whole section of judgments Chapter 24 was God pronouncing judgment against the whole world. Well, when we broke before Christmas, we had closed out that section and had just begun the next section in Isaiah, a little three-chapter section, chapter 25, 26, 27, that some call the book of songs. Excuse me, chapter 25, the first of those, was a song of praise, praise to God. The remnant of Israel, the believing remnant, delivered, preserved, and delivered through the tribulation, praising God for their deliverance, for their salvation, for his mercy. Tonight, turning to chapter 26, is going to continue that same theme. Another song, a song of of salvation, a song that some have called Song to the Rock of Ages, that I think we're going to find is a very appropriate title before we're done. In the middle of everything that's going on, 
this Omicron wave. And, and, and that's just one of, of many things that's besetting us, right? 7% inflation in December. Russian aggression on the borders of Ukraine and Kazakhstan. North Korea and China both test flying hypersonic missiles, missiles that travel five, six, more than five or six times the speed of sound. Unprecedented times, uncertain times. Except the future, we're going to be reminded tonight in God's word, the future that these times are leading to, that are, that are funneling us toward. That future is not at all uncertain. We know what the future holds. And because we do, and because we know the one who holds the future in his hands, we can already praise him with songs that have already been written. Let's dive into chapter 26 together. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. And I'm going to stop right there. We've been away for a little while, but hopefully not so long that you don't recognize that phrase, that signal, in that day. Those words and words like it when we're reading prophetic scripture always point us to the end times. They always refer to some or all of that future period of time, beginning with the tribulation and continuing on into the millennial kingdom. Now we know from context, it's been a while, but if we think back to chapter 24, we know from context that this refers specifically to the part of the day, the part of the day of the Lord immediately following Christ's return. And in that day, still verse 1, the song will be sung. We have a strong city. God will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in. We've noticed before <coughs> throughout Scripture, throughout our study, that when Israel returns from a time of wandering, from a time of sinning, from a time of disobedience, when Israel returns, along with her restoration, along with her entering in, as she's doing here, those times are always accompanied, almost, I can't think of an exception, but I'll say almost always accompanied by singing, by praise, by worship. Think back to the beginning of Scripture, the book of Exodus, Israel flees Egypt, follows Moses out of Egypt. And as soon as they get out of Egypt, they turn on Moses. Why? The Egyptian army is hot on their heels. Moses leads them across the Red Sea. And immediately they repent. Wait a minute, Moses, you did know what you're doing. You are following God, and God is good. And immediately following that repentance... That entering back into relationship, we have the song of Moses in Exodus 15. I'll sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Nehemiah is another example. Israel returns to the land after exile, after a time in Babylon for disobedience, for idolatry. Israel returns, rebuilds the walls, rebuilds the temple. And in the dedication of the city, the rededication, they're singing praise choruses, countermarching each other around the border of the city. Well, here again in the future, we've got the same idea, the same thing happening. Israel repenting, God responding, and a song of praise and rejoicing going forth. A song that at first seems pretty reminiscent of the song that we read in Nehemiah with the mention of the, the gates and the walls and the towers. Open the gates. Now I suspect that this is the believing remnant of Israel that were refugees in Jordan. The believing remnant that took shelter in the rock city of Petra returning to Jerusalem returning to meet Christ there, returning in triumph with him. But pause for a moment. 
when was Jerusalem rebuilt? In the future, I mean. After Antichrist comes against the city, levels the city, at the end of the tribulation, at what point do we read that Jerusalem is rebuilt? Don't get me wrong. Clearly, undoubtedly, Jerusalem will be. There isn't any question about that. But I don't know of any scripture that indicates that it happens immediately, instantaneously, miraculously. I mean, it could be. But I think at the very least, there's a double meaning going on here in verse 2. We have a strong city. God will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in. Who is Israel's protector and defender who is variously described as a gate and as a strong tower? I think the idea here, and I think it's pretty clear that Jesus is not only the one who rebuilds their strong city. He is their strong city. And the believing remnant of Israel is entering into his presence, entering into fellowship with him. We're just two verses in and it's already gotten chewy. Let's keep going. Put a mark next to verse 2, though, because we're going to come back. Verse 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah the Lord is everlasting strength. For he brings down those who dwell on high, the lofty city, he lays it low. He lays it low to the ground, he brings it down to the dust. The foot shall tread it down, the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. Remember the city of the world and the city of God, that dichotomy that we saw back in chapter 24 and 25. It's the same idea here coming back around again. The city of God being established in the person of Jesus. The city of God being built up, raised up. The city of the world the city of man being brought low, lower than low, trampled under feet, brought to dust by Jesus. Jesus exacting vengeance. Jesus performing justice on behalf of the poor, verse 6, on behalf of the needy, on behalf of the persecuted and oppressed. That's the song that Israel sings when Jesus returns, one of the songs. There'll be more before we're done with Isaiah. But now, verse 7, there's a shift in perspective, a shift in tense, if you will. We're going to slip back in time from the song of triumph accompanying the return of Christ to prayers of believers still in the tribulation, that believing remnant as they wait for Christ. Verse 7, we're back in the tribulation as we read, the way of the just is uprightness, O most upright. You weigh the path of the just, yes, in the way of your judgments. O Lord, we've waited for you. The desire of our soul is for your name and for the remembrance of you. With my soul, I've desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me, I'll seek you early. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Sounds like one of David's psalms, doesn't it? God promises justice. God rewards faithfulness. God is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so in dark seasons... In the midnight hours, we cling to those truths. We hang on to those promises as we wait for him, as we wait for the day, verse 8, that he will show himself strong, that he will deliver, believing by faith, verse 9, that he will come, that he will show himself strong. All the while, struggling perhaps to remember what, what we want to believe is true, that God who is just is also merciful. And struggling to see 
that in his mercy, God has purpose in his delays. He's long-suffering. Why? He's willing that none shall perish. God desires that all would come to repentance. And so we remember that in the night seasons, and we determine to wait for the purposes of God, the gracious purposes to unfold and be fulfilled. We wait for some to turn their hearts to repent. We wait for others to experience enough grace, enough mercy, enough second, third, 89th chances that to, to make it so that for all of eternity, no one will ever be able to say, God brought judgment too soon. God didn't give them enough opportunity to repent. Some will repent, knowing that that's why God delays. Some will be judged because they refuse to repent. They refuse to acknowledge God's grace for what it is. They get to the point where God knows no amount of grace, no, no number of times their offered grace will be enough to change their hearts. Verse 10, let grace be shown to the wicked, yet he will not learn righteousness. That will describe so many does even in our day describe so many doesn't it i read that and it's frightening to me to think how close that came to describing me was in the twin cities over the weekend my hometown towns i guess minneapolis st paul sharing at the calvary in suburban minneapolis and Part of what I shared in teaching on Sunday morning was my testimony, because part of my testimony took place there in Minneapolis. And I, I told the story of spinning out on I-35W, just south of downtown Minneapolis, as I was running away from someplace I shouldn't have been in the first place, and almost dying, almost dying twice that evening. And, and, and realizing there, facing the wrong way in the middle of a snowstorm, facing the wrong way on a busy freeway, that I was going to die. If I kept going the way I was going, I was going to die, and I was going to die apart from God. And, and, and God brought clarity in that moment. He showed me his mercy in that moment. He he showed me that he had delivered me, that he'd saved me, not, not just from what could have been a fatal car accident or a fatal encounter earlier that evening, but, but he showed me in that moment the time after time after time leading up to that time that he'd been merciful. The 10 times, 20 times, more than that, if I can think of 10 or 20 times, there, there had to be a multiple of that. Times that God's hand of mercy shielded me from the consequences of my stupidity. And, and, and he impressed upon me, I was only breathing because of grace. And if I kept going the way that I was going, eventually that grace would run out. Still verse 10, in the land of uprightness, he will deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. That could have been me. I was so close to rejecting God's grace past the point of no return, past the point where my heart would have been hardened forever. And age over age, over age that's most of humanity. And it will continue to be most of humanity into the tribulation. Verse 11, Lord, when your hand is lifted up, they will not see. But they will see. The idea is then they will see. Eventually they'll see. 
and be ashamed for the envy of people. Yes, the fire of your enemies shall devour them. Even when God's chastening reaches unprecedented heights, war, famine, pestilence, natural disasters that we know to be supernatural disasters, all happening in exactly the way Scripture anticipates, all unfolding the way that prophecy says that it will, judgment bearing God's unmistakable signature, some will refuse to acknowledge what it is they're looking at. They'll, they'll refuse to admit what's unfolding. They'll refuse to confess where it comes from, who it comes from. Second part of verse 11. They'll see and be ashamed for the envy of people. Yes, the fire of your enemies shall devour them. And then, then, Lord, you'll establish peace for us. For you have also done all our works in us. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem on, on a pretty regular basis here. In our various prayer meetings, men and women on Tuesdays, the body together Sunday afternoons. I know a lot of you pray daily for the peace of Jerusalem. Why? Scripture tells us to. We're instructed to. But we're reminded here the peace of Jerusalem comes when the Prince of Peace comes, and only when the Prince of Peace comes. Israel today tries to threaten their way to peace, negotiate, bargain their way to peace, battle when their back is against the wall militarily their way to peace. One day Israel, believing Israel, will realize, will recognize what we just read, that Jesus was the only way to peace all along. And more than that, the second line there, verse 12, he was the author of everything good. Anything good that ever happened, he was the author of that all along. For you have also done all our works in us. All good things come from him. That's almost trite to you and me, isn't it? It's not me, it's Christ in me. That, that's Christianese. We tune it out. It's, it's, it's so familiar. Everything good, everything true, everything righteous that we do, we do in God's strength. We do in the power of the Holy Spirit. That, that's almost, yeah, yeah, sure, sure territory. It shouldn't be, but it, it gets to be that way, right? Point is, we know that tonight, you and I do. Israel has to learn that. And believing Israel, the remnant of Israel that confesses Christ at the end of the tribulation, will come to know that. They'll confess their idolatry, verse 13. O Lord our God, masters beside you have had dominion over us. We've allowed people, habits, goals, priorities, all kinds of things to be more important than you, but we repent now, still verse 13, by you only we make mention of your name. You've led us back to you. It's only because of you that we know you, but we do. And they're rejoicing. Because they repent, because God has drawn them back, chastened them to repentance, they get to exit the tribulation and enter the kingdom. Side note, the last time we were together in Isaiah, a bunch of weeks ago, I think, I don't think, I'm pretty sure I misspoke. I think I said on the way to saying something else, something that sounded like unbelievers at the end of the tribulation might have another chance might have an opportunity when Jesus appears as the conquering king, when he appears in glory, that they might have a chance to bow at his feet. I don't think that's actually true. I don't think that scripture teaches that. I think that the plain teaching of scripture is that seven years of tribulation 
is all that the world will get. Seven years of tribulation, judgment after judgment, disaster after disaster, designed by God to put eternity on our hearts, to force humanity to consider the meaning, the purpose behind all of it. Angels flying from one end of the heavens to the other. Witnesses ordained by God, 144,000 sealed by God, preaching the gospel. The two witnesses, perhaps Moses and Elijah, supernaturally protected by God, preaching in the streets of Jerusalem, broadcast throughout the world. Those who don't repent by the end of the tribulation, those who believe the lie, those who are ensorcelled by the great deception, I think their opportunity, their window will close. There are those who come to faith during the millennial kingdom. There are people who will be born during the millennial kingdom and have an opportunity, as we all do, to choose Christ. But I think those who haven't chosen Christ at the end of the tribulation have no second chance, just as those who haven't chosen Christ by the end of our natural lives have no second chance. End of side note, but I wanted to correct that error from a few weeks back. Those who believe, and, and specifically who's in view here is the believing remnant of Israel, they will enter the millennial kingdom. Verse 14, they're dead, they will not live. They're deceased, they will not rise. Therefore you've punished and destroyed them and made all of their memory to perish. Those are the unbelievers. But as for the believers, verse 15, you've increased the nation, O Lord. You've increased the nation. You're glorified. You've expanded all the borders of the land. And this is true both relationally in terms of the people who are Israel and geographically. When we were talking about Israel past, present, and future this summer, we noted that Israel has never occupied the fullness of the inheritance assigned them in Genesis 15. The, 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 the territory that God promised Abraham and his descendants, Israel has never fully occupied, not even under Solomon. But they will under one greater than Solomon. Verse 16, Lord, in trouble they visited you. They poured out a prayer when your chastening was upon them. They is that believing remnant. Those persecuted by Antichrist. Those who fled, who were refugees in Petra. Those who recognized God's chastening for what it was. Two big goals in the, in the tribulation. One is judgment upon the nations. The other is chastening God's people, Israel. God's chastening had its desired effect, verse 16. As a woman with child is in pain and cries out in her pains when she draws near the time of her delivery, so have we been in your sight, O Lord. Same metaphor, and not a coincidence, obviously. Same metaphor Jesus uses in Matthew 24. A woman in labor. Wave after wave of pain like wave after wave of judgment, the seal judgments and the bowl judgments and the trumpet judgments, getting closer and closer together, more and more intense, leading up to delivery for the woman in labor, leading up, leading up to deliverance for Israel. Verse 18, we have been with child, we have been in pain, we have, as it were, brought forth wind, We've not accomplished any deliverance in the earth, nor have the inhabitants of the world, the, the world dwellers, the world worshipers, nor have they fallen. There's, this is dripping with irony. Slow down and make sure that you catch this. With child. Now to you and me, that describes a woman in labor, the metaphor from verse 17. And, and, and that's absolutely true, but let's go deeper. Let's scratch at this for a moment. Why is Israel in labor? What's the reason for this travail? Because they were with child. Notice the wordplay. 
Israel was with child. A child was with them. And Israel rejected him. They sowed the wind, still verse 18, and reaped what? Whirlwind. Proving again and again and again and again for these last however many centuries, 20 and counting, that they were unable to deliver themselves. But now, now verse 19, now your dead shall live. Together with my dead body they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Scholars debate this one. Does this, is this speaking of Israel being reborn? Israel, a nation who is called to lead the world in praise to the Lord, finally fulfilling her purpose finally fulfilling God's promise? I mean, it's certainly that. At the very least, it's that. There are those who think that it's more than that. There are those, and, and I tend to agree, there are those who see in verse 19 the promise of resurrection. We don't see resurrection spoken of very often in the Old Testament, but not never. And I think that if we, if we read verse 19 in context, if we look at verse 18, that speaks of, of humanity not being able to save itself, but finding salvation when they call upon the name of the Lord. I think that this is John 11, 25 and 26. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Could just be speaking of Israel. This just could be the dry bones prophecy of Ezekiel revisited. But, but I think it's more than that. Either way, when they awaken, when they arise, whether this is believers who have fallen asleep or whether this is Israel, long sleeping in judgment, what happens when they awake? Verse 19, they sing. But in the meantime, verse 20, come my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself as it were for a little moment until the indignation is past. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and no more cover her slain. So, so we're back in the tribulation again. We've shifted perspective again. We're back hiding until God's judgment raining down upon the earth has ended. Take shelter until it's over. Reminds us again of Matthew 24. Jesus telling the disciples, when you see the abomination of desolation, run for the hills. And it's from this verse and others that we surmise they might flee to the rock city of Petra. We'll have an opportunity. I know I keep referencing that obliquely, We'll take a deep dive into that. There'll be an opportunity later in Isaiah to, to look at that in some depth. But flee and take shelter until Christ returns in judgment. When he returns to defeat Antichrist and the power behind Antichrist. In that day, verse 1 of chapter 27, the Lord with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. Leviathan, that twisted serpent and he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. When we were in Job, Job chapter 41, we actually hopped over and looked at this verse because my conviction <coughs> is that Leviathan, the serpent referenced here and in Job, is none other than Satan himself. Now, is this Satan specifically in chapter 7, verse 1? I don't know. Because in Revelation, we read that Satan is bound for a thousand years, not killed. So is this perhaps Antichrist? In the same way in Isaiah 14, we looked at Lucifer and understood that in speaking of Lucifer, we were really seeing a picture of Antichrist, one empowered by Lucifer. I'll let you debate that one on your own. But some of you are still staring at verse 20. You're saying, oh, oh, oh. 
Could, 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 could that point at something other than Israel? I think it could. Some, <laughs> some believe that this is a picture of a pre-tribulational rapture. In part, well, let me, let me skip that. Some, some see pre, pre-tribulational rapture here. Caught up into the air to meet Jesus, to be sheltered in heaven while the Lord goes forth to punish, verse 27, the earth dwellers, those dwelling in iniquity. A picture of believers sheltered until the indignation, another name for the tribulation, is passed. I, if you want to see it there, maybe. I don't, I don't think it's as airtight as some tribulation verses. In part, and, and I might be nitpicking here, but verse 20 says, shut your doors behind you. And I stumble over that because another picture, or a picture of the tribulation, a shadow of the tribulation that we see in the Old Testament, is the flood. And there are those that are delivered through the flood who take shelter in the place that that God has Noah prepare for them. But who closes the door behind Noah and his family? God does. Like I said, I might be nitpicking. And this might be a perfectly good picture of the rapture. I'll, I'll let you decide what to do about that too. But whatever you decide about verse 20, that doesn't mean there's nothing for the church, nothing speaking of the church or to the church in chapter 26. You might see it in verse 20. But I think we definitely see it in verses 12 and 13. Lord, you will establish peace for us, for you've also done all our works in us. O Lord, our... God, masters beside you have had dominion over us, but by you only we make mention of your name. That's Romans 5, isn't it? Romans 5 at the beginning, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom and whom only we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. It's the same idea, isn't it? And if we see our salvation described in verses 12 and 13, and I think we do, throughout the centuries, throughout dispensations, salvation is salvation, is by faith in Jesus Christ. And, and, and if we're able to see that in verses 12 and 13, maybe we need to go back to verse 2 again. Open the gates that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in. I don't know, Patrick. The righteous nation, that sounds an awful lot like Israel. I agree. But flip over to Psalm 118, if you will. Psalm 118, if you've got a study Bible or a Thompson chain Bible, it might actually point you here. Because in Psalm 18, verse 19, we read, Open to me the gates of righteousness, I will go through them. Let's back up a couple of verses and get some context. Let's go verse 13. You pushed me violently that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly, is exalted, does valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them, and I'll praise the Lord. Let's keep going. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I'll praise you for you've answered me and have become my salvation. What's the gate of the Lord? 
Verse 22, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. That's clearly prophetic exactly, in exactly the same way that chapter 26 is prophetic. It's clearly referring to Israel. It's clearly speaking of the same time and the same series of events. But, but don't we read this and recognize ourselves in it? Don't, don't we embrace this as, as describing our salvation as well? The stone which the builders re rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Don't we claim that? Don't we point at that and say, that's our story? He's my Jesus? If that's true, if, if, if we say that, if we say, open to me the gates of righteousness, I will go through them. If we say, God, open to me the gates of righteousness, and I went through them, Jesus brought me through them. Then, then back in chapter 26, if we say, open the gates that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in, then I think we get to say, verse 13, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah the Lord is everlasting strength. I, get, I, I think we get to say that. You and I, believers in Jesus Christ, covered by the same blood with which he covers the nation Israel. I get that. I think we get to claim that same promise. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. I think we get to say that. I think we've got to say that. Hebrews 12 speaks of the end times as, as the time in which that which can be shaken will be shaken. I know plenty of people who, who, who say that's me right now. Everything in my life that can be shaken is being shaken. I know people who are living that personally. I have friends on both coasts going through horrendous divorces. Their families, their world as they know it being torn apart. We have brothers and sisters in this church dealing with cancer, dealing with COVID, battling addiction. And, 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 and some of those battles, it's not an exaggeration to say people are battling for their lives. Yeah, we're spared whatever you think of verse 20. Whether verse 20 points to it or not, we're spared the tribulation. That doesn't mean that we won't experience tribulation. Trials, heartache, loss. Suffering. Jesus promises that we will. But what we take away from Isaiah, the, the, these prophetic words of believing Israel during their tribulation, verse 3, you'll keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Those who come to Christ and cling to Christ through the tribulation declare that, sing that as they enter the kingdom because Jesus has proven it to be true. A friend of mine posted on his blog a really great article about a month ago. Some of you saw it. I think a couple of you reposted it on Facebook. And the, the theme, the, the title if you will, of the entry was, what do I do with all this pain? And, 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 and in his really excellent post, he explores this idea that pain can either be a mentor or a tormentor. Those, those are his words, Pastor Tim from Calvary Fremont. Pain can be a mentor or a tormentor. That's a powerful thought. And it's the same exact dichotomy that, that we've been looking at in this chapter. There are those who allow the pain of the tribulation to propel them into God's arms. 
Those, those that spend the tribulation desiring him, verse 8, remembering him, same verse, seeking him, verse 9, learning from him, same verse. And, 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 and when they do, as they do, as they find him and know him in a new way, as they embrace him, they are embraced by his peace. Those who allow the pain of, of, of persecution, of events, of tribulation, of loss, of those who allow it to be a mentor, a teacher, a guide, a reminder, those, those who, who, who let it, who let it in, who allow it to come close, will find that pain can be a stepping stone rather than a stumbling block. But that's not everyone's reaction. It's not everyone's reaction during the tribulation. Remember, there are those in verse 10 who refuse to learn from the pain. They refuse to see the lesson in God's chastening, just as in, as in our lives. In our tribulations, there are those who refuse to learn, who, who won't turn toward what's happening, but, but try to push it away, try to run away. And in doing so, are refusing to learn and grow. There are, there are those who see pain entirely and only as the enemy. Something to eliminate from their lives. Something to run as far away from as quickly as possible. But, but see, when we do that, we're running away from, from the mentor, from the teacher that God has allowed in our lives, from the molder and the shaper he's brought into our lives. The molder and the shaper that he intends to use to make us more like Christ. You see, pain, pain moves us. That, 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 that's just what it is to be human. Pain moves us. None of us is very stoic for very long. But we decide what direction it moves us. We decide whether to go toward it or away from it. And, and, and the, the, the thing that we see here for the world during the tribulation, to flee pain, to reject it, to say there's nothing there for me and I want it gone, all of it. To flee pain often is to flee peace. Pain moves us, but we decide what direction to go. When someone curses us, we have a choice. Curse in return or respond to cursing with blessing. Which, is, which reaction does Jesus commend to us? Bless those who curse you and pray for those who abuse you, Luke 6, 28. But see, to do that, we have to turn toward them. We have to look at them. We can forgive them from a distance, but to bless them? When someone wounds us, we have a choice. We can feel sorry for ourselves, run, hide, hunker down. Or we can turn toward that pain. We can take it and embrace it and let it form compassion in us, compassion towards others experiencing similar pain. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 2 and 3, 3 and 4, the beginning of the chapter. God allows us to go through things so that we can minister to those going through things. Turn misery into ministry, if you will. Universe is binary. I haven't said that for a while, but it hasn't stopped being true. There's God, there's not God. Everything falls into one of those two categories. When something happens to us, whatever it is, there's Jesus and not Jesus, and those are the only two responses. When pain enters our lives, the question we need to ask, if Jesus was hurting in this way, what would he do? 
when Jesus was hurting in this way, what did he do? This life and everything in it is a, is a giant potter's wheel, right? And at every turn, pun intended, we can run or we can yield. The clay which resists the potter that refuses to let events and circumstances shape and mold it ends up stiff and hard and ugly, immature and not particularly useful because it refuses to grow. Oh, I'll grow, just, just not that way. Except that's God's way. A lot of times pain is God's way of refining us, conforming us into the image of Christ. The clay that trusts the potter, the clay that we read about in verses 7 and following, submits, believes, believes that God is good, that his purposes are good, and he doesn't do anything without a purpose. And the things that he allows into our lives, he desires to use. He intends to redeem. He will not waste. He intends to use the things in our lives, painful though they may be, to make us beautiful, to make us usable, and to make us, verse 3, peaceful. Because every time we trust him, we learn that we can trust him. Every time we cling to him, we're reminded the safest place the only safe place is next to him. Pain will either, Pastor Tim again, deform us or reform us. It'll either leave us a useless slump or it'll leave us a little bit more Christ-like. Our choice. And that's the thought behind verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. It's the thought behind verse 3. It's the thought behind verse 20. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. Hannah, why don't you come on back up? Verse 20, yeah, it might be a glimpse of a preacher of rapture, but whatever else it is, it's the Lord inviting us to take shelter in him. It's the Lord reminding us that he is our strong tower. He is our stronghold. He's our rock and our defense and our hiding place. That's the heart behind this song of praise, this song to the rock of ages. And by now I think that you probably have in your minds lyrics of a hymn that we haven't sung in this church in a long time, but we need to bring back and we're going to bring back tonight. Because it's the rock of ages pictured here as we, as we sojourn through these crazy times dark times, hard times, and times that I think are going to get darker and harder, that we need to remember there's peace a prayer away. There's peace living in our hearts. There's peace waiting to embrace us if we reach out. If we cry out, if we pray not, Lord, let this season pass, let this trial pass, let this affliction pass, but if we pray, Lord, be with me 
in what's happening. Let's close in worship and consider the words as we do.